In a previous video, we had a look at these two pieces of equipment and we used them to create a broadcast quality analog television signal. Now in that video I did briefly mention the topic of stereo, but of course I couldn't go into it in that video because it was long enough as it was. So today we're going to have a look at our first stereo system, and that is going to be NICAM. Now NICAM is actually digital, but despite that, this is a thoroughly obsolete technology. So this is really just a reflection on what was. Now as promised, we've got a whole lot of extra kit to look at here, so let's go through and introduce it all. At the top here I've got an Arcam Delta 150. Now this is a terrestrial NICAM receiver, and as far as I know these were only sold in the UK and really only in the very early years of NICAM. The idea was basically to upgrade a home AV setup which was previously mono to stereo. And they were marketed as a bit of an audiophile device, but in reality they're not really all that special. It's just the tuner and the decoder from a NICAM capable TV thrown into a box. Now this here is a 5688 NICAM receiver from Philips and it basically does the same thing as this one however it probably would have cost 20 times more and there is a good reason for that it is built to a very high specification and it also has a number of features in it that the Delta 150 doesn't have that would be useful for broadcast monitoring and also in R&D and I will cover those briefly in this video. Now moving down here we've got our 5687 and this is the actual NICAM modulator and this has a stereo left and right inputs, RF carrier output which is combined with the output from this vision modulator, those are both fed into this up converter and transmitted with the rest of the signal. Now in the realm of off-the-shelf NICAM equipment this is a pretty early device, these were available from 1988 onwards and there wasn't really a lot else around back in those days. So with the exception of the UK of course where broadcasters actually built their own bespoke solutions, if you're from a country that rolled this out very early then Odds are this might have been the kit that actually created your NICAM signals. Now on top of that I've got a 5686 which I will talk a bit about in a minute. We need to get a bit of backstory out of the way first. And over here we've got some test equipment, the spectrum analyzer that we saw in the last video, and another spectrum analyzer which I'm using to demodulate the NICAM carrier which we'll talk about in a little bit. Now before we start playing around with the kit, I just want to pause for a few minutes to talk about NICAM itself. Now NICAM was not only used for transmission, by transmission I mean from a transmitter site to a viewer's home, but it was also used for distribution. That means distributing audio within a broadcaster's network. So let's have a look at the history of NICAM, how it works, and the big picture of how it was actually used. Now let's start off here with a quick comparison to Compact Disc. Now at a quick glance the specification looks a little bit rubbish. We've got a cutoff frequency of 15 to 16 kilohertz, but in practice a substantial portion of the population can't actually hear anything above those frequencies anyway, so not a lot of content actually really makes use of it. Certainly in the case of NICAM it would have been very difficult and expensive to achieve a greater frequency response than that, probably so much so that the technology wouldn't really have been economical. Now at its heart, this is a compression technology, and it is a very simple compression technology. So simple that it can actually be implemented with primitive logic devices. And back when engineers were designing this, that's actually all they had to work with. Now straight away we can even see what the compression ratio is here. It is a 14 bit word, as I said, but only 10 bits of that are ever transmitted. Now in the case of a very quiet sample, those upper 4 bits, they're just going to be zeros anyway, so we don't need to transmit those. It's only when it starts to get a bit louder that those upper bits start getting set, and and that's when we have to slide the window of what we transmit over to the right. And of course in the most extreme case, where we have a very loud sample, then we have to throw away the four least significant bits. But it was worked out by engineers that this loss of detail cannot really be perceived by the human ear. This is actually the basis of how modern codecs work, just stripping out information that we can't perceive. Now NICAM was originally developed for FM radio backhaul, and that's essentially where we have a transmitter that is a very long way away from the source, and it's just not really practical to transport those analog signals over such long distances, so they have to be digitized. Now this is something that was originally done by the BBC, and as far as I know, they're the only ones that do it. What they wanted to do was to get six audio channels down an E1 line, and if we work out the resulting bit rate, it's just a little bit higher for an E1, so we just need that bit of compression to get it down there. And that's essentially what NICAM offers in this situation. Now in this scenario, the, I've shown this has three stereo channels, but it may in practice be six mono, or I think in reality they did a bit of a combination, so some stations were mono, some were stereo.
Now, what we just talked about there is Nike M676, which is not the same as Nike M728, which ultimately is what the viewing public were going to receive. Now, the difference between the two is trivial. It's just a different bitrate. But in practice, it's a very big difference because, of course, all the infrastructure around it expects those fixed bit rates. So they are fundamentally incompatible with each other. And the BBC was heavily invested in Nike M676, and they somehow wanted to use it for television broadcast. Now this big stack of kit here is a Nike M676 for television setup. And this is a topic that comes up on forums every now and then, so I'm just going to briefly talk about it. Now this was used only for distribution. Now this equipment does also digitize video, that is why it is so large. Now the problem with it is, is that the Nike M that it encodes was of course incompatible with what viewers ultimately were going to receive. So when it arrived at the transmitter, they had to convert it back to an analog signal, then re-encode it as a slightly different type of Nike M. Now even to the unenlightened, this is a little bit absurd. Now, I've not managed to find much information about this in the archive, particularly why they went down this route, and even people I've spoken to who were involved in this never seem to quite know the answer to that question. So I, I kind of suspect this might have been a managerial decision, but either way, it's an approach that they eventually had to abandon. Now, to realize the true potential of Nike, and that, of course, is that end-to-end -end digital transmission where we're not going back to analog anywhere along the way, the Nike M728 variety would have to be combined with another technology that UK broadcasters were already using. And there's a technology called Sound in Sync. Now this is something that was invented by RCA in the 1940s. And the basic idea was, instead of having separate links for video and audio, why not just combine them together into a single link? Now this here is an example of a piece of equipment that would actually do that. And what it basically does is digitizes a single mono audio channel into PCM. That's basically the type of encoding that we would have on a compact disc and inserts it digitally into the video signal. Now what we're looking at here is, of course, a video signal that has had sound and sync data inserted into it. Now the equipment doing this, this is not some kind of 1960s item or some kind of World War II item. This is actually a fairly modern piece of equipment from the BBC. So of course what we're looking at here is the horizontal sync pulse. Now normally in composite video, this is just wasted bandwidth. And this is really what RCA looked to leverage when they came up with this idea. So we've got two traces on here. We've got the video input, which is the yellow, and the blue is the video output. And as we can see, it's got some data inserted into it. Now this is the basically the most advanced type of encoding that was really feasible at the time. And once again, they had that familiar problem that if we upgrade this to stereo, there's just not quite enough bandwidth. So NICAM basically came in and saved the day here. Now, of course, this type of signal is not transmitted directly to viewers because, of course, in analog television, they kind of have absolutely no idea what to do with a signal like this. So when it arrives at a transmitter site, these digital signals have to be stripped out and they are then recombined as a subcarrier. And we're going to have a look at that shortly. Now the first organization to realize the full potential of NICAM, and that is to combine NICAM 728 with Sound and Sync, was not the BBC, but their main competition, the Independent Broadcasting Authority. Now that effort was led by Graham Sordi, who is one of the most key people in the industry who was involved in the development of these technologies. He worked on it at the BBC and at the IBA. Now there is actually a video interview with him on YouTube, and in that he demonstrates some of the equipment that he oversaw the development of. And that was developed by a Danish company located just a few kilometers away from the lab that developed all of this Philips kit that I'm using in this video. I definitely recommend checking that out. So now that we've summarized the technologies involved, let's have a look at an actual diagram to see how all of this fits together. And the key thing to note here is that there are many different sources of video and audio, but no matter what it is, there is always a NICAM encoder at that source. So as a viewer, the source of the NICAM that you're receiving is constantly changing depending on what you are looking at. And the other thing to notice here, of course, is at our transmitter, you know, as I previously said, we cannot transmit the composite video signal with all of that sound and sync data in it. So that has to be stripped out. And that is done by that sound and sync decoder there. And that, one of the outputs of that decoder, of course, is the digital NICAM data stream. And that gets passed onto a modulator, which modulates the subcarrier that's ultimately transmitted to viewers. The other interesting thing to note here is that the NICAM has a second purpose, and that is actually to provide the analog mono carrier that gets transmitted alongside NICAM for the benefit of older TVs and VCRs that of course don't support NICAM.
So we just talked about how things are done in the UK, but what about other countries? Well, another country that I've decided to focus on is New Zealand. And if you couldn't tell from my accent, there's a course where I am from. So I'm really interested to know how things were done there. Now, unlike the UK, where there is an absolute deluge of information about this stuff, and it's very hard to know what to even include in a video like this, it is the extreme opposite in New Zealand. I could not find any information online at all about how broadcasters built their networks. Maybe it was written down and published at some point, but I just couldn't find it. So what I did was I reached out to some engineers and well, they did open the door to my questions, but not as much as I would have liked. After a considerable amount of time, I was able to scrape together enough information to make this diagram. Now, I don't know how accurate it is, but I feel like it's probably a pretty reasonable representation of what we used to have. Now, I've actually shown two different broadcasters on here, and I'm not going to name names. But the point about this is that they both use different technologies to distribute audio and video within their networks. And this explains one of the things I was a little bit puzzled by when I first started talking to these people. Despite us being one of the first countries in the world to roll out NICAM, well, the engineers, they just didn't really know very much about it. And that is because NICAM didn't exist within their networks. It's only when we come over to the company that does the transmission that we find the NICAM. The links come in, they are demarked, they're turned back into analog signals if they had previously been digitized, and then they are fed into that NICAM modulator. Now there's actually three channels there, left, right, and mono, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. But after that, we can see the NICAM subcarrier is combined with the Vision and FM subcarrier exactly as it was done in the UK, and beyond that, it is indistinguishable from what was received in the UK. Now, this is not a very optimum way of doing this, but of, because of course, we've broken that end-to-end -end digital the signal had to be converted back into analog in the transmitter hut. But this is just an easy and convenient way of doing it. It doesn't require huge amounts of investment and network re-engineering. Now, I appreciate this is only a small country with a small population, but that elaborate end-to-end -end digital scenario the UK had as far as I know, was relatively unique to the UK. If we looked at what other countries had, we probably would have found something more like this. Now, before we get back to our setup here, there's just one last thing to have a quick look at, and that is just a comparison with some of the other analog stereo systems that existed. Now, the main one that competed with NICAM was Zwei Kanalton, which of course was developed in Germany. And I'm going to have a look at this in another video. Now, this system, unlike NICAM, is completely analog and it only has a maximum number of two channels, whereas NICAM, technically three were possible. Now, I have said there the first launch of NICAM was 1989 in New Zealand. I don't know if that's truly the first launch. It's the first one I can find reference to. If anybody knows of an earlier one, please do drop it in the comments. So this sort of information is quite hard to come by. And of course, for comparison, we've got MTS there, which was used alongside of M NTSC. So now that we've got a bit of an understanding of NICAM, let's just briefly explain what this 5686 is all about. Now, unfortunately, this is going to involve a couple more diagrams, but I promise these will be the last in this video. Now, let's suppose back in the day we have unlimited money and we want to build an end-to-end -end digital NICAM setup and we only want to use Philips equipment. Well, this is roughly what we might have ended up with. So over at the studio there, I've got the 5685. Now, this is not something I personally own, but I don't need it because it's the same thing as the 87. The only difference is they don't fit the RF modulator into it because, of course, we don't need it. All we are doing with that is encoding and digitizing the audio. We then take a digital output from it that is then transported somehow or other, and Philips were a little bit vague about this, over some kind of link that can carry AES3 audio. And that, of course, is then fed into the 5686, which does the actual modulation, which is then combined with the FM audio and vision subcarrier using other equipment. And also in that diagram, we've got the ability to decode the NICAM at the transmitter and feed the vision modulator, which creates the FM mono audio subcarrier. So that's really what this is all about. Now, that's as I said, this is a, probably a pretty unlikely use case. So let's have a look at some other possible use cases for the 5686 and the first one is actually in a TV factory so in this scenario here we've got a 5687 but that's of a standard BG but we also want to have a system I NICAM carrier which is a slightly different frequency so we take the digital output from the 5687 feed it into the 5686 so then we have system BG and system I NICAM carriers from a single source. And that is a heck of a lot cheaper to do it that way than having two 5687s. 
Now another possible scenario is where we have a NICAM solution that has been made by a different company but they don't actually include the modulator as part of their solution. Now the BBC's NICAM solution is an actual example of that. However, in their scenario, I think it's very unlikely that they would be using Philips equipment. It would be some kind of British item. So now that we understand the technology and the kit, let's talk about the functionality. Now for most people, the only way they knew NICAM was just something that provided stereo audio. But there are actually some other modes which we're going to talk about now. Now the first one of those is dual, and we can actually just push the button on the front panel to activate that. So when we're in this mode, this is what is used for typically a bilingual transmission, some kind of program that has more than one audio track. And when it's in this mode, we no longer get stereo, but we just get two mono channels and the receiver has to be told which one to actually output so in this case we just push this button here and we can toggle between the two channels so one and two these LEDs up here on this one there's actually dedicated buttons for it now another mode here is mono so when we press that one we can see once again on the display up here this one says mono and on this one our NICAM light is on but the stereo is off so this is NICAM mono now in terms of the actual data it's exactly the same bit rate nothing changes about how it's transmitted it just sets a flag in the NICAM data to say to the receiver it's not stereo anymore now there is another obscure mode of operation here called data now this is not something that I understand was ever actually implemented, but I think the idea this was going to be used by some kind of red button service or something like that. <laughs> Back in the days, of course, 728 kilobits per second was actually quite a lot of bandwidth, so they could potentially have done something quite interesting with this, but it just never actually happened. And this is just a very rare mode that we may see on some equipment implemented in some way or other, but probably not. And in case of the Delta 150 here, it, it just says no more NICAM. This one knows that there is still NICAM, but it just, it, it's, it, obviously I don't have any data running through this at the moment. Now there is one more option here. Let me just put it back into its normal mode. And this is this one here that says sound flag. Now, Philips were a bit confused about what they actually call this one in the previous version of this item. It's actually has a different label on it, but basically this is referring to something called the reserve sound flag. And it's a very obscure feature in the NICAM specification, which basically allows the receiver to know that the FM subcarrier that has been created by this modulator is actually a different audio track to this one and this basically allows us to enable a three channel scenario so if I set this to dual that means our NICAM um, or A and B are both different tracks and I also set this one then hypothetically for a receiver that fully implements this the viewer will be presented with three different audio tracks which is a very very obscure scenario but it is a possibility now one scenario I thought of for this and this was just a guess is maybe we set the it back to stereo again now this one could carry maybe like a narrator or something but the NICAM could carry some stereo music with it for people who were just a bit bored of the the narrator but I don't know I, I don't think this was ever used and the Delta 150 here doesn't actually implement this functionality properly however my my modern Samsung TV does. So let's go over and have a look at that now. Here we are at my contemporary Samsung television, which is less than two years old. Now, despite that, it fully supports NICAM, which is quite funny, really. I wonder how they test it. Now, what we are looking at here is, of course, the output of the 5644. Now, you may have heard me say this unit doesn't generate a widescreen pattern. Well, that is a small lie. This one does, but that is not a standard feature. So I'm just going to unmute this audio. Now what we're listening to now is the FM mono carrier, which of course is that classic phase locked 1 kHz tone that the 5644 and its predecessors all generated. So if we have a look in the menus, if we go into the broadcasting menu, and this is a bit of a chore to get to this, but down here we've got this dual sound option. Now notice there are actually three different sound options here. We've got the FM mono. Now if I switch it to the Nikem A channel, this is a 1.5 kHz tone. And on the Nikon B channel, I've got a 2 kilohertz tone. So let's just exit out of that and mute it again. Now if we have a look at the back of the 5687, we can see there are actually three audio inputs and one output. Now the output is meant to be connected to the vision modulator for the mono audio, and normally it is the A and B inputs mixed, but in this mode it is actually switched over to the C input. That's just a nice little convenience feature, which I doubt was really ever used.
So now let's have a look on the Spectrum Analyzer and see what's new. Now if you watched the previous video, this will be looking rather familiar. We've got our vision carrier on the left and of course the FM audio carrier just after it. On the right we've got this enormous digital carrier and that of course is the NICAM. Now these days we could fit a fairly respectable bitrate video stream with stereo audio into that amount of bandwidth so NICAM was just a really inefficient technology. But back in those days it just didn't matter all that much because there was so much less stuff on the airwaves. Now the other thing that is different here is that this is a system I transmission whereas previously I showed system BG. Now this was a relatively uncommon scheme which I believe was born in the Irish Republic however it was eventually adopted in the UK which became its main region. The only difference is there is about a half a megahertz more video bandwidth which means there is a little bit more horizontal resolution and that of course means the sound carriers have to move upwards to accommodate it and that includes the NICAM carrier which is why we have this variation. Now when equipment like this was installed and set up there was quite a bit to think about in terms of how the signals are combined and particularly their amplitudes with respect to each other and that is actually one of the fancy features of this 5688 receiver. It is able to measure the amplitude of the NICAM carrier and tell us whether or not it is within the correct range. Now let's have a look at this modern spectrum analyzer and see what it's trying to tell us as it's been sitting here all of this time. Now presently it is in demodulation mode and it is tuned to the NICAM carrier. Well, sort of. I'm actually using the output of the BG modulator for this demo because it can't demodulate a digital carrier in such close proximity to another unrelated signal. Now the first graph of interest here is the one on the top left. Now this is the constellation. Essentially this is a dot plot of where the I and Q signals are at the point of time that they are measured. Now ideally Clearly those dots have to fall within the red circles and they do because this is a direct perfect connection. Now if you're not familiar with IQ signals there are plenty of other videos on YouTube which explain them. Now the other graph of interest is the one on the bottom left and this is a view of the IQ signals in the time domain. Essentially this is what is called an eye diagram and once again I'm not going to go into the detail of this myself but in short summary the eye is the hole in the center and the more open it is the cleaner the signal. So now I'm just going to throw things off a little bit by changing the center frequency of the spectrum analyzer to demonstrate this. Now as I start to adjust it the eye begins to close. And then eventually we lose it all together. So we'll just put it back to where it was now. Now this is another fancy feature of the 5688 receiver. It's able to measure how open the eye is and this tells engineers how much margin for error there is in the transmission and ideally that has to be as high as possible. Now bear in mind that the 5688 was designed in the mid 1980s so there's no fancy graphical display it just shows it as a percentage. However it is superior to the spectrum analyzer because you can measure it when combined with a vision carrier. That is the end of this video and just a few notes to wrap up. As things presently stand there is no documentation available for any of this equipment other than a few paragraphs in old catalogs and that has made things pretty difficult. So if you're feeling this was incomplete that is why and I really hope this will change sometime in the future but despite a lot of trying I just haven't had any luck yet. Now there was of course a subject that I didn't go into in detail and that was sound and syncs. Now while I do have some of that equipment I don't yet have a complete setup and I hope someday to be able to find the rest of it so I can make a video about it. Now if you found this interesting hit subscribe because of course there are more videos in the pipeline. But for now thanks for watching.